Well, good morning. You guys ready? How many of you guys are just jacked up and cannot wait until Thanksgiving? Wait, 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 hold on, let me finish. Until Thanksgiving. Until Thanksgiving. How many of you guys are jacked up and can't wait for this morning? This Thanksgiving, I love Thanksgiving week. I think it's just a great time. Gratitude, gratitude removes attitude for most people. If you're having a bad day, if you find something to be thankful for, you can flip that script and make it a good day. So God says in all things, be grateful. So this, but this Thanksgiving is a video that we play almost every year. If, how many of you guys are, haven't been here for a year? You haven't gone here yet for a year? Raise your hand in here. Okay, this is a video that if you're here next year, which I hope you are, you're going to watch it. I love it. It's near and dear to my heart. It reminds me a lot of my family, and I think yours as well. So watch this video, and I'll come right back up. And now, a Thanksgiving moment. You know, this is the time of year when we realize what it is we have to be thankful for. Of course, I'm talking about Thanksgiving. I know it. Hang on a second. This is called suede, buddy, so you need to be careful with that lollipop. It's time to be with your kids and your nieces and nephews, and don't touch them. That's just going to egg them on. That's just... It's time when I remember all the warmth and love of conversations, and, uh, well, let's just... Guys! Hey, guys! Seriously! Why don't you Whoa. come help? Don't even... But I know that I remember growing up... You know what, this is not gonna work. Haley, I'm sorry, my back is killing me. This kid's about to break my knee off. This one is as ripe as it gets. We need some, a lot of wipes for that one. Well, that's right, and I remember the turkey and dressing, and uh, you bet there was some cranberry sauce if uh, Uncle Teddy had anything to do with it. And uh, Uncle Floyd, I, 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 I tell you what, Haley, can, you've gotta get her out of here because my headache is about to explode here. Um, hey, seriously, Daryl, how about helping out this year? Hey, I'll tell you what, why don't you go outside and wait for me? All right. And uh, I remember uh, sitting around and laughing as a family, and sweetie, I have got to have some room here to do this. I know, I t you know what, this is like a practical joke. This is terrible. Okay, I'm about to freak out here. Daryl, should we put you at the kids' table since you're helping about as much as they are, or? Hold on, hold on. No point, do not point at me. Do not point. So my hope is that you have a very blessed time and a relaxing Thanksgiving. This next video is one that I hope touches your heart. It's touched mine. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. James 1, 19. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? James 4, 1. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, leads to death. Proverbs 14, 12. The application coming out of all that we looked at last week was to begin to understand the most difficult part of any conflict was seeing our part in it. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. 
Hebrews 3.13. Hey, hon, do you think that I feel I always have to win an argument? Well... Hey, that's not an answer. Actually, that is an answer. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? I invalidate people when I get worked up. Sometimes, yes. When you win an argument, you don't really win anything. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 19:11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Be, patient. Be devoted to one another in love. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. Honor one another. Comfort yourselves. one another. Agree with one another. Love others. Forgive others as Christ loves and forgives me. You're ready. Can we get out? Can we get out? Can you guys? Yes, we can get out. What can I carry? You know, that would be great if we came with that attitude this morning. We're at a family gathering here, and if we could just come and maybe just examine our own hearts and just be challenged uh, by the Word of God, I think that that would be a great thing. So I'm Herc Noblet. My name's Kelsey. Um, we have, sorry. You're anxious. Go <laughs> ahead. Go for it, girl. We have a couple announcements I'm so excited to give, apparently. Um, if this is your first time, we want to say welcome. We have a couple announcements just for you. First off, um, we have some church... Uh, some information about our church available at our information center right in this lobby. And um, there's also two free coupons in here. One is for a free drink and the other is for a free t-shirt. So if this is your first time, grab one of these, learn a little bit about us. Also, um, you'll notice we don't take an offering in service. We ask that you not give and just let this service be our gift to you. Um, however, if you call Oak Ridge your home, you're attending here every week. Um, there are joy boxes throughout the campus and there's also online giving available. And then lastly, we don't take communion in service, but there's a room right behind me where communion is offered called the Reflection Room, and that'll be open all morning. Great, thanks. Yeah. You did a good job. Um, what about, you. there's no edge tonight, right? But there, when, There's no edge. We're in a little break right now, but we have a special Christmas edge on December 10th. So um, that is for our students, middle through high school, and um, that's designed for them, but really it's for everybody. So feel free to come check that out in just a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. In two weeks, on December the 3rd, we have a baptism service. And you know, I, I looked up. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> I looked up our stats for this year. We've had four baptism services. We're going to have our fifth. You know, we've baptized 104 people so far this year. It's pretty cool. Um, there's 11 signed up right now for the December 3rd, so we'll be giving you all a call that, that have signed up here. I'll be calling you probably this week or early next week. But if you believe in Jesus Christ and you haven't taken that step and, and gone public with that, we'd encourage you to do so, and you can get information at the information booth there. Um, we've got the um, – there's also not – Obviously not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, I'm doing a two-week toolbox class on marriage. Marriage is easier than you think. It's on Wednesday night from 7 to 8.30. There's a sign-up sheet and a little information, again, that you can get at the, at the table out there, and I encourage you to do that. But you guys know as you came in, you had those, those uh, envelopes that say be rich. You know that we started this last year. We did it in the month of December last year. We're going to do this as an annual thing where we can really just help out um, some other ministries in the area and really throughout the world. And we've got a couple of those up here today. So I know Judy is a member of our church. She helps me tremendously with the care center, answering phone calls, calling people back. So could you give her a very, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you. So um, Judy, you're up here representing who? 
Feed my people. Feed my, and you're actually on the board of Feed I My am. People. So why don't you just give them a you know 30-second synopsis of all that Feed My People does, if that's even possible. I don't know. And, what, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's possible. I, I they, thought she was going to say, I don't know. And I was going to say, well, you're a board member, and you don't oh, know. Yeah, that's yeah. not very good. So No. They offer long-term and short-term assistance for people in need. Um, they offer food. They have a, a thrift store in which all of you need to check out because I took a group or not me personally, I did though. Uh, a group of us, our small group actually went there yesterday and worked in the thrift store and you can't believe some of the stuff that people donate. I mean, brand new stuff with tags and they sell it for $3 and it helps feed my people for their cause. But right now their need is more like for uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste, stuff that food stamps don't buy. There's such a shortage uh, because of the cut of the food stamp program that uh, they have no resource, people have no resource to get this. They also offer assistance with low income housing and they desperately need volunteers. Beautiful, so, so we, a lot of people call us and they, they are specialists in a lot of those areas so we kind of hook them up with, with Feed My People and do that Correct. kind of thing, right? And if people here want to serve, because it would be great if, if, if all these organizations would have lots of Oak Ridge people that are serving, they can meet you in between services out. Yes. At, I think there's a yeah. table set up a table. and you'll have more information. Just real quick about how, and maybe I'm putting you on the spot. Do you know how many people throughout the year Feed My People actually helps? Uh, it? It's in the thousands. I, I, I thought would, I read it was like 40,000 people or something like that. I was going to say 52,000, like but... Also, How about 53,000? We'll okay. go with that one. Yeah. Also, an awesome thing they did last weekend, I attended a fashion show that they put on, and it's all donated clothing and volunteers that put on, you know, that wear these clothes. And it's a fundraiser, and it was just an awesome, awesome event. I get Pastor Tom next year has signed up for that. He's going to be part <laughs> of that fashion show. So good, exactly good. Right. So thanks. So you can get information there. You want to you pass that and maybe scoot places? Thank you. This is David Altus. Davis, why don't you, David, why don't you tell us? Yeah. He doesn't go to our church, but we can clap for him anyway because he's doing a great thing. So why don't you tell us who you represent? Sure. Thank you for having me. And I represent the Pregnancy Help Center of South County. We're up at 55 in Lindbergh behind Honey Baked Ham and Toys R Us. If you know where that is, we're on there's a side street, and we're just right down there. What we do is we minister to women who are in a crisis pregnancy or they just need help. Uh, in particular, the focus, our primary mission, is uh, women who are at risk for abortion. Uh, and of course, uh, the taking of an innocent life is uh, against God's heart and his desire. And it's all throughout the Bible. The Bible is all about life and the battle is against death. So that's our primary mission. We, we, we accomplish that by ministering to the woman first and sometimes the, the uh, the father of the, of the baby is there oftentimes. Um, I'd say our biggest need is that we are flat out of space. You're talking about numbers. So uh, we've gone about four years ago. We, we, were, uh, we had seen 29 new female clients during the year. And we started advertising with this, this, which is a smartphone. And all of a sudden, our numbers jumped to 109 the next year and 112 the next year. Sounds like it's a very smart phone. And, uh, and so our little space became kind of cramped. And then this year, so far in 10 months, we've seen 212 new female clients. Now, they come back, so you're talking about about seven, 800 total visits. Um, and then we have opportunity to both uh, have a chance to save the unborn baby, and we have quite a, quite a few conversions in that regard or, or saves as we call them this year we're up to about 69 um, That's awesome. and but we are flat out of space uh, we're talking about putting our next uh, employee which we're looking to hire in the basement and the, it's an old house so the basement floods on a regular basis but so that's our challenge and uh, you know we just put it out to God I was telling uh, Jamie this morning I said you know when you have a challenge you just that you can't see the way to do it, you just give it to God. And that's what he wants anyway. I'm looking at her because she knows. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, so, uh, and Julie Weber, uh, Julie, stand up wherever you are. Are you here? That makes her feel really good, <laughs> David. Yeah, that's, uh -huh. yeah so yeah, Julie's on the board. She's on our board of directors, so, you know, she can answer a lot of questions. I mean, I'll be out front during the services, between the services, so... 
thank you for having us here. Great, thank you. So that, that's what this Be Rich campaign is all about, going and helping people that are out in the communities that are really on the front lines and doing some things that maybe we can't do here. So uh, and encourage you, it's $39.95 a person, great way to teach your kids uh, generosity and to work on that. So I'm going to say a prayer uh, for these two ministries, but for us as a whole as well. Dear Father in heaven, um, you know, you said that, that Jesus came and, and in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And Father, the light shines in the darkness. And an amazing thing is that Jesus then in turn looked at us and said, you, church, you are the light of the world. And so, Father, I pray that, that we as, as Christ followers, that we rise up with our, with our money, with our time, with our talents, with our treasures, with everything that we have, Father, to show people the light of Jesus Christ and to make a difference in people who are hurting, who are confused, and who just need your wisdom and your grace. So, Father, I thank you for these two organizations that are doing just a great work, and I pray that you prosper them, you grow them, and that you help us, uh, that you use what we give to, to just maximize the impact for your kingdom. We are grateful that we get to be a part of a place that just loves and worships you and we prepare our hearts father to be convicted to be challenged but most of all god to give you all glory and honor and praise it's in the mighty name of jesus we pray amen when you stand up say hello to somebody around you we're gonna sing
Awesome. Thank you, guys. We're going to be singing another song here. It's called Give Me Faith. And um, how many of you would like more faith? You know what? Scripture says it's a gift. And I think we should pray and we should ask for that. And, you know, as a church, we've taken a big step of faith. And I didn't mention it in announcements, but we closed on the Oak Bridge City Church on Thursday. So pretty cool. In my own life, you know, I, I want more faith. And sometimes I just... You know, sometimes I just doubt and sometimes I, I have fear and I, I wish that wasn't the case. But probably about six, seven months ago, I decided, you know, I, I really wanted to examine this. And so I, I memorized a big, uh, about almost two chapters of the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. And I memorized that. And in, in this, it says, you know, that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And ultimately... What that comes back to is the promises of God and that, that we can bank on who Jesus is and that, that he will accomplish what he said he's going to do. So I've searched the scriptures for promises and, and my faith is increasing, not where I want. But the cool thing about Hebrews 11 is that it lists all of these like Old Testament saints and all of these people who did great things and amazing things through faith. I mean, they conquered kingdoms, they administered justice, they escaped the edge of the sword, all these kind of things. But you know what? So many of them were still jacked up in so many areas of their life. And so in a weird way, that kind of gives me a little hope that we can still have faith and still be humans that fail. And our God knows that and still says you're the light of the world. So we're going to sing this next song, and, and I hope you sing it with full voice and just take in some of the promises and the words of these and, and realize that we are people that live by faith, and, and our faith is in the king of the universe. Amen. Let's sing.
You guys can go ahead and take a seat. A little hesitation. I didn't know if that song was over yet or not there. Why don't you guys take a few moments, you know, and, and again, faith's a gift. And the cool thing is we can go and speak to our Father right now, and, and our Father says that he gives only good things to his children. So ask him, if you're, if you're a little weak in your faith, you know, I would even say that that's okay because God's doing a work in you. And you know what? It's not necessarily the amount of faith we have. It's who our faith is in. And that is in Jesus Christ, the rock and the king. So why don't you take some moments on your own, pray to God, and then I'll pray before Tom comes up. God, we've sang songs today how you are able, and we see that clearly. There is nothing that you can't do. And, Father, you are always faithful and true to your word. So as, as, as your kids, I just pray that we pour over the scriptures that you have left for us. And we look through, and, and we claim those promises, and we live our lives with those clearly in mind, knowing that you will come through. And then, Father, we know that, again, um, that you're our anchor. Jesus Christ is solid even when times are rough, even when storms go. And in the passage that I memorized talking in, in Hebrews, Father, you, you give us examples of people who did great things, but also many of those people were actually martyred and killed, and yet it, they still had faith, even though things didn't turn out the way maybe they thought they should have. But you were in control. And Father, they've got their reward right now. It's an amazing thing. And then God, um, I, I just know that we are weak and that we struggle sometimes and that we battle guilt and shame and, and, and just we continue to do many of the things that we think we've gotten over and, and we just fall back into bad habits. But Father, again, give us faith to continue to go after you, to seek you and trusting in your magnificent mercy and grace and knowing that you are changing us day by day more and more into the image of your son. So Father, I know Tom's given a challenging message today. And Father, I pray that our hearts are humble, that we really examine our own lives and, and think, do we put you first in every single aspect of our life? Because Father, you say that when we do that, when we do that, the reward is out of sight. Father, we just thank you and we just pray for more faith as we trust your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Herc. Well, second time, good morning. Hey, how about that city church, huh? That's going to be great. It's part two of how to be rich. I was 20 years old, and I was playing basketball. It was my sophomore year at a college, and it was mid-season. So I'm guessing there's about 15 games into the season. And our coach came to us, and, and he told us, he said, uh, look, I, I don't want anybody shooting outside of the lane. If you're not familiar with basketball, there's a little lane. And he says, I don't want anybody shooting outside of the lane this game. And... Uh, I didn't really like that idea because the only place I could normally shoot as a guard was outside of the lane. And he said, so uh, this is the deal. He says, shoot outside of the lane. He says, you're going to be sitting on the bench. And uh, I was point guard and I was captain of the team. So I promptly came down, first play of the game, we got the tip, the ball came to me. I promptly came down, went to the top of the key outside of the lane, about a 25-foot shot, and took the shot, first shot of the game, very first shot of the game. Totally disregard what he said. And right then and there, time out, 30 seconds of the game, time out, I took the shot literally like this and started walking to the bench. No, that's exactly what I did. I thought it was ridiculous that we couldn't do that. I walked to the bench. He calls a timeout. He gets the team. He goes, what were you thinking of? What were you doing? I just said, look, I was going to take a shot. I think this is nuts. I'm not going to listen to you. That's the way it is. He goes, you will sit at the end of the bench. I said, nope, I'm sitting right here next to you. So the rest of the game, I sat uncomfortably next to him. I didn't get to play one second the rest of the game. This is a true story. Right? Do you think, by the way, as I sat beside him, when go to the, do you think that I was blessed by him the rest of the game? What do you think? I mean, do you think that he was doing good things for me the rest of that game? What do you think? What do you guys think? No, not at all, right? Should he have been doing good things for me? 
But some have said yes. I don't know. I don't, no, he shouldn't have been. I mean, I totally, totally uh, defied him. I could care less about pleasing him. At that point of the season, there's some stuff that had gone on. I'm not telling you I was right, and I shouldn't have done that way, but that is exactly what happened. And uh, I had no, no, no regard for pleasing him whatsoever. Sure enough, sat at the bench. I'll tell you what else happened a little later here in a second. Could care less about pleasing him. Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. We learned this last week. And without faith, it's the kind of faith we're going to talk about today, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You give a rip about pleasing God. Tough question. That's the question. I didn't give a rip about pleasing that coach. Not a rip. Do you give a rip about pleasing God? Speaking to you Christ Christians, you Christ followers, do you care at all about pleasing God? Because this verse encapsulates so much, and it starts with wanting to please God. You know, I'll never know how things uh, would have gone if I had obeyed my coach that day. I, I really wouldn't have known that. And, uh, but I do know one thing. After midseason, my playing time was almost nothing at that point. I went from starting point guard to very little after that. And uh, that was the result of that. So I don't know what it would have been if I, I would have wanted to please him. That might have been different. But you know why I didn't please You know why I didn't care about pleasing him? This is a true statement. I didn't trust him. I thought he was untrustworthy. I'd seen stuff he'd done during the year. Not even his coaching. I didn't even like his morality. I didn't like his ethics. Nothing. And I just came to the point where I said, you know what? This is it. I don't trust him. I don't care about pleasing him. That's it. He had let people down before. I'd seen that. He had uh, lied to me before. He had said things. Hey, do you believe God's trustworthy? No, I mean, I don't not shake a head. Because I, I don't think you're ready to shake your head. I mean, you believe it, but do you want to please him? I mean, if you believe he's trustworthy, Scripture talks about a lot of things. So you can just shake your head and say yes, but trustworthy means you trust him and you put into faith the things that you trust him with. So I'm not looking for an easy answer today. Herc said this is going to be challenging. It's going to be a challenging message. It's challenging for me as well. Do you believe that your faith, that your active faith in God, which we're going to talk about, will actually lead to his blessings or his reward? Because we just read it again. I'm just going to read it one more time. And without faith, and he just talked about the heroes of faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible to please God. Do you care about pleasing God? Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He, your faith pleases him, and he rewards you for that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Here's what a blessing means in that instance. Here's what it means. It's his supernatural power working for you. It's a life filled with divine coincidences. Now, you'd say, well, I, don't, I haven't had many divine coincidences. I know you haven't had the right faith. Sorry. God is true. Do you believe that God is supernaturally working his power for you? And are there a number of divine coincidences going on regularly in your life? And if it is, then this faith that we talk about you've probably put into play. And it's probably just not words. It's probably not just shaking your head. Yeah, I, I trust God. It's actually a faith that has action to it. That should be the marks of it. You see the divine power of God working for you. You realize that this is a life filled with divine coincidences, God things, God moments, God times. That's the faith that God wants us to have. And, and there weren't a lot of them that had it. And I don't think today there's a lot of people that have it, but all of us should if we want to please God. I wrote this, and this is just true. If you don't actively trust God, you will not see the activity of God in your life. Let me say it again. If you don't actively trust God, you will not see the activity of God in your life. He's there, and he loves you, and I'm not saying anything about that. You just won't see those divine coincidences. You won't believe that the supernatural working of God is in your life. He just won't. Two types of faith, faith that uh, I said, like when all of you said, do you have faith? 
Do you trust God? Most people would say yes, across all realms of Christianity. And there's two faiths. They're called crisis faith and active faith. We all understand the first one, crisis faith. Here's crisis faith. I come into you, and I said, hey, I just wanted you to know that spot that we felt found on your kidney, it's cancerous, and it's bad. Right then, we all understand crisis faith. We all understand getting on our knees, praying for God, and saying, okay, God, we want you to change this, but if you don't change this, we still hold on to you. That's crisis faith. Crisis faith is when you lose a job, and you say to yourself, well, I know I lost this job, but it's going to be okay. God's going to put something better. That's crisis faith. faith. We all understand that. We understand crisis faith when it comes to a busted relationship. You can't get any lower relationship-wise. You can't feel any worse or any more hurt. And then you trust out and reach out to God. That's crisis faith. We all understand that. In fact, most people who have hardly no faith, when those things happen, all of a sudden they have crisis faith. Then they start believing actively in God. But the kind of faith that God wants you to have is the faith called an active faith. That's this faith that God is talking about, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's this faith I'm talking about that he rewards every time, 100% of the time, with his blessing and divine coincidences, 100% of the time. It is the right way to be. It is the right way to live. It's active faith. And it's obeying and trusting God with doing what he asked us to do in three categories, three categories. God wants you to trust him with your time, your talent, your giftedness, and your treasure. And this is the key to the rewards or the blessing part of God. But I want to talk about how that's played out. That's, that's, it's easy to say it. Trust God with your time, talents, and treasure. But what does that look like? What does that look like? That's where... Um, I'm going to try and, try and push into this for the next 15 minutes. Jesus said, there's this great commandment. There's this big deal. This is the one you want to enter into. This is the, I want you guys to listen to this, this, is what he said. You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, that's the great command, to love God with all your faith, to love him with all your trust, to honor him with your life, to follow him, to seek him with everything you have. In other words, he says, God should be first. First with your time, first with your talent, first with your treasure. Not second, not third, but first. That's, that's what this love the Lord your God is with all your heart. And he said, I can't love God all the time. I get that. He's saying first. First. This is the key that God's looking at. It's this principle of the first. In other words, God should be first in time, talents, and treasure. And let me just, I'm married. Surprise, you know that, right? At times, my relationship with Kathy is sideways. I mean, it's not totally what it should be. It's not totally defined by love because of a dog. I feel at times she puts the dog first over me. Now, I know when I say this that I could bring another 500 men up here. <laughs> when I say, Kathy, would you like to do something like go see a movie? She says, no, I think I'm going to take the dog for a walk. <laughs> hmm. Kathy, you want to go out to eat? No, I'm going to feed the dog first. You guys get the idea? Kathy, could I get a back rub? as she's petting the dog for an hour. No, my arms get tired. <laughs> well, my love meter goes down because I'm not what? First. Amen? Is that right? Okay, I'm gonna just push a little bit more. What weekend is this? It's the weekend before Thanksgiving. No. It's rifle season for hunting. Now, hold on. Yeah, right? A lot of you wives say, do you know what's first in our relationship? Killing a beautiful deer. Right? You, you said, sweetie, do it. No, I got to go hunting. I'm not ripping on hunting. Not at all. 
I'm just saying that if you don't feel first and hunting feels first, then you don't really feel loved. Because first, first is the key part of love. All right, just one more. This is a little bit more maybe serious. You know, when I do marriage counseling, I do very little of it. Her and his team do so, so much better job of it. But when I do marriage counseling, I hear people tell me and they talk about their families. They had three or four kids. And I say, how's the marriage? Not very good. And I'll listen to them, and I know what happened. Over the course of the 20-year time span when they had their kids, the kids became what? First. The marriage became what? Second or third or fourth. How do you think that relationship looks? How do you think that feels? I'll give you another one. Well, all he ever does is work. His career comes first. Her career comes first. That's not love. It's first. It's first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love the Lord your God with your time, talent, and treasure. Your first time, your first talent, your first treasure. It's the principle of the first. And you know it. You already know it because all of you could agree with the things I've said. You could pick something else in a relationship. First is important. Second means nothing. It doesn't. Second can be just as good as last. And I'm not trying to step on toes. And I'm not trying to do the math of it. I'm saying first means a lot. For Kathy, I want to be first in her heart. Now, let me say this. I want her to love God first, but you get the point. Of every human on planet Earth, even over my children, and vice versa. That's it, first. Principle of the first. Say with me, principle of the first. Principle of the first. It's true. It's real. It's how we're made. I'll give you an example of this, just a quick one. To now turn the page kind of towards God. And we're going to without faith, it's impossible to please God. We're going there. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. Genesis chapter 4. Four chapters into the writings of God at the beginning of time, we get this principle of first because this is a principle of God, from God, through God, that God leans into, understands it's part of who he is. Genesis 4, 3 through 5. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel, his brother, also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and he was downcast. You can read the rest of that story. So here we get this picture. Cain brings some fruits of the soil. Abel brings firstborn of his flock. God didn't like Cain's offering. He liked Abel's offering. Why? God, a meat eater, doesn't like fruit. What's the deal here? I mean, when you first read that, you're like, you know, what is it, stinky strawberries? Or what's the deal? I don't, you know. Let's read it again. Listen to me. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits. In the course of time. I Meaning he had his harvest he brought in. I'm going to read into this. After he'd gotten the best of the best, after he'd gone through some stuff in the course of time, he decided to give God an offering. Just whatever he had. And the offering might have been a big offering, but it was in the course of time. He didn't do it first. And now we read. And also Abel brought an offering, fat portions for some of the what? Firstborn of his flock. The very firstborn. And God says, I'm pleased with Abel's. I'm not pleased with yours, Cain, because you don't love me. I wasn't first. And I'm not going to bless that. I know your heart. Time, talent, treasure. The first part, time. It's one of the Ten Commandments of God. Get this. Keep the Sabbath holy. One day a week, the first day of the week, and you can argue first day in the week, but one day a week, the beginning of your week, I consider Sunday the beginning of my week. The first day of the week, he says, you keep it holy. In other words, you set that apart for me. And when you set that apart for me, that first part, I will bless the rest of it. If you do not set that first part on me, I will not bless the rest of it. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Do you believe that God rewards when we put first him first? So this attendance thing of your regular attendance pattern, stay home. You don't want to be blessed by God. 
Now, I'd love to see every one of you. I'll tell you that. But if you really want the blessing of God, then the first of every week, you need to set it aside for God and trust that he will reward you and bless you for the rest of the week. Because that's the way that it is. That's what he wants. It's one of the Ten Commandments. And I hope you're not coming here just out of just sin. I'm trying to check the, the box off, but actually you understand you want to honor God. You want to please God. And you can please him by, with your time. The first day of the week, set it aside to God. And I'm not saying you've got to stay and kneel at home all day, but he created this thing called the church. I believe Jesus would be in church every single week. Not because he had to. Not because there's some dynamic preacher. Not because, but because he wanted to please God. And he wanted to say, God, you're first. And you're first with my time. Not every single moment of every single day, but the first. God can bless the rest if you give him the first. And he will bless the rest if you give him the first. You get your week blessed because of it. You know, I've heard this thousands of times. This is no exaggeration, thousands. I cannot wait to go to church. It just does something for me. If I've missed church, it just feels like I'm missing something. Raise your hand if you've ever thought that or said that. Look around you. Is God a liar? It's just so true. The best thing, one of the best things I've ever done is that Kathy and I, when we became Christians, we said, first day of every week, Sunday, we're going to be, and we're going to set us apart to God. Now, I might mow the lawn the rest of the day. I might go golf. might go do whatever it is. But that day, I'm thinking of God. That day, I'm starting it that way. In his church, his body, his gathering of his people. And you know what? The rewards of regularly attending church, I can't even count them. I cannot tell you. And for some of you that are just like haphazard with your attendance, I just want you to feel more of the blessings of God. I do. And I think if you did that first, you kind of wouldn't feel like second. First day is God. And I believe he rewards those. He blesses those who do that. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over. All right, the second thing is talent. Talent. In other words, to love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, you've got to give him your time that first day of the week, that Sabbath day, that day. He's created the church to do that, this gathering of us. The second one is talent. Jesus said he came to serve and not be served. In other words, he came to give his talent to his people, his church, his groups of people. Scripture teaches that all of us have been given some form of talent, some form of giftedness, that all of you are important to what God does, that he's given you something that can help advance his kingdom, that can help love his people more. And he expects you to use it, quote unquote, in the church, in the movement of God forward first, in the loving of his people first. He expects you to use that, use that first, first. So if you're a great singer and you make millions of dollars singing, the first place you should offer that, if you're a Christian, that gift is to the church because you're offering it to God. It's the first, the principle of the first. It's not an option. If we do that, if you, if you offer your gift to God first, then he blesses the rest of your time. I want to go back to this again. If you've not felt the supernatural movement of God in your life, these holy coincidences, it's because you've not followed the principle of the first. And if you do follow the principle of the first, you will see those come, and you'll find divine coincidences, and you'll feel the favor of God, the blessing of God in your life. You will. It doesn't mean it makes life easy or perfect. It makes it blessed by God, touched by God. So if you're honoring with your serving, that's why we have a ministry fair. Sure, the church needs you, but you need it more than the church needs you. Because God loves you individually. He understands the principle of the first. We understand it. I don't have to go back to the dog, the hunting, and that again. Understand that's how God looks at it when we take this from him. It gets worse in a second. This is the thing I wish I would, if I could go back and say, Tom, which do you wish you would have taught on more or better? This principle today. In 14 years, this is at the top of my list when I had to think, oh, Tom, you've, you've just, you've ripped the people by not teaching this. The gifts that you give should be huge. 
You know how many times I've had this tell people until they tried it? I just didn't know I could sing until I tried it. I mean, I love coming to the musical tryouts. Some of you think you can sing, right? And some of you can. Many of you can't, all right? You're like me. And what I mean by that is, is that, I mean, you can all sing, but you get what I'm saying. So I've seen people after person. I had one guy named Jason Mertz, who's a song leader at church. He came in and he said, he said you know, I, I think I sound pretty good singing. And he came in to, this is 20, 20 years ago, and he started singing. He was phenomenal. And all of a sudden, God, God gave him a career on that. He's a musical pastor at a church. And we just see it over and over again here from uh, people that are here. If you offer that to God, God uses it first. And who knows, maybe it becomes your career afterwards. Speaking, I remember Matt, this is, uh, Matt comes up to my son. We're down at Big Stuff Camp in Florida. He never hardly said anything. Matt, in all of his life, was kind of the quiet person, never said much. We have 200 kids out in an audience. Matt comes up and said, Dad, I said, I'd like to speak to these guys and tell them something down at Big Stuff Camp. My jaw about hit the floor. I looked at her and I go, who is this kid? He's been down at Big Stuff for like, you know, two months. What? And he speaks. And it, and it was made sense. And it encouraged me. And I heard the voice of God in his voice. And today, he's now preaching to hundreds of college kids in Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, he offered that gift. God took it the first. Some of you just serving and greeting somebody. Do you understand how God's looking to bless you because you've opened that door? Cleaning the church. Do you understand how God's going to bless you because of offering that gift to God? Holding babies, teaching children. Do you understand that God looks at that? I want you to offer that first to the church. First, my argument with our church getting big is this. We have so many volunteers that we can't get everybody to serve every single week because there's too many of you that serve, and we don't need that many. If I was you, I would be hollering at this church, at me, for saying, Tom, you have to create opportunities for me to serve and serve regularly, at least for sure, because that's how God will bless me for me giving me first. Now, with all that said, you can go outside of these doors and you can go to feed my people. You can go to the crisis pregnancy center and you can serve. And here's the promise. God will bless you beyond what you will ever, ever imagine. That is the truth. You offer that to him. He blesses that. Well, the last one is treasure. He blesses your time, the first 10 first percentage of it, the first time of it, the first of it. He blesses your talents as you surrender to God. And the last one is his treasure. There's 500 verses in the Bible that are written concerning prayer. There's 500 verses in the Bible that are written concerning faith. That is a lot of verses. There's over 2,000 verses in the Bible on the subject of money and possessions. Do you know Why? Because money is actually a test from God involving your faith in him. It's a test from God involving your faith in him. Remember the Cain and Abel story? Cain, I don't like that. What you brought was after the fact. Abel, I liked yours. It was the first. I don't know the amount. Exodus 23, 19. I'm going to give you a principle in a second. That's, you're going to have to wrestle with it. You really are. Exodus 23, 19. Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Bring the best of your first fruits, the first to the house. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. I promise then, then your barn will be overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. A tithe is 10%. But get this, listen, look at me. It's the first 10. It's not your last 10. It's the first 10. That's the gift of faith. No, and I don't know if I'm going to get another, another lamb. I don't know if I'm going to get more fruit. It's the first 10 going to God and say, here, I don't know if I'm going to have enough at the end, but I love you and I trust you. And without faith, it's impossible to please you. It's the first 10. It's the first 10. 35 years ago, Kathy and I learned this, and we put it into practice from day one. The first 10, and I cannot tell you, money has never owned me. Contentment has reigned in my life. And when I compare myself to the entire rest of the world, I'm in the top one-third, 
top one-third of one percent of all the world, and you're in the top three percent of all the world if you've been born in the United States. The first fruits, it's the first ten. It's like, this is yours, God. It's the first ten is always his in, in, in what we get. That's the tithe. An offering is on and above that. This was this statement made in Malachi 3, 8 through 9. Malachi was a prophet of God. God spoke through him. Spoke to him. Here's what he wrote in Malachi 3, 8 through 9. Will a mere mortal rob God? This is God. Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? How are we robbing you, God? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. You're taking what's mine. The first 10 is not yours. God's given it to you and entrusted you with it, but it's not yours. It's his. To return back to him in his kingdom work in faith so he can reward you. And I know you, you say, well, that math doesn't work, Tom. The math doesn't work. I know. It takes faith. I get it. Giving your time doesn't work either. Neither does giving your talents. None of that works. Except do you believe that God's faithful? I mean, do you? It's easy to nod our head at the beginning, isn't it? Yeah, I believe, I, I trust God. You see how he wants to, this faith him first makes so much of a difference. And you know what? What's so crazy about all this? When Christ followers practice this, their lives show it. They say it's true, not by their belief, but because the results how are we robbing you? What a thought that we've robbed God. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2. Paul wrote, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, when you gather, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. What do you think that sum of money is? Verse 10, it's the tithe. Saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. I don't know if it's true, but I read an article as I was researching this, that if Christians tithe, we would put back into the economy $17 trillion, which would feed every starving person, which would shelter every homeless person, which would take care of every baby that's not taken care of today if we just tithe. And the blessings of God would be yours as well along with that. Luke 6, 38. Words of Jesus. Give, and it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Haven't felt the pleasure of God much in your life? No coincidences. Maybe it's this right here. This is the words of Jesus. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He says, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But if you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a nap and swallow a camel. So he's not saying it's just about giving. He says it's about trusting him and doing those other things. He said, but Jesus, he didn't take away the tithe. He said you should have practiced it. Just a thought for you. Do you think Jesus gave the first tenth of everything he got back to God? What do you think? Kingdom work. Yeah, he did. Of course he did. I don't want you to walk out of here feeling guilty. I don't think God works that way. I just want you to walk out of here with saying, I want more faith. Remember how Herc said that he's been praying for faith? I pray the same way. You think I don't struggle with this? I made a uh, promise to God when I became a pastor that I, I would never take a dime for funerals. That I would give that all back. If somebody gave me something, I'd give that all back to the church. Well, normally, uh, these funeral homes, they take the money beforehand from you. I guess when you've got a funeral, they 
have a stipend for a pastor if he does something. Normally that money's between 100 and 200 bucks. I do a lot of funerals. And do you know every single time I get that check, I'm tempted, tempted to keep it. Even though I clearly promised to God. I think, I think God's looking and saying, Tom, do you want my rewards? I love you. Whether you keep that or not, I don't, it's not me that needs it. And by the way, I'm not asking you to tithe for this church. Give it somewhere else if you, if you want to trust me on that. Give it to some other organization that advances the cause of the church. Now, with that said, I do believe that the local church is the hope of the world. And I cannot tell you that there's a better place to give it to than this. But I just want you to hear me on this. Your time, your talents, your treasure. It makes so much difference. See, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Do you believe that? There's a lot of people that did. I looked up some of these guys that trusted God with their time, talents, and treasure. David, who stood before Goliath. Do you know what he trusted God with? He had the skill to throw a slingshot because he had killed a bear and a lion before. He said, God, I'm trusting you that you're going to use this. I'm going to give this to you. And he killed a foe that nobody else could come out. He was the first one to do that out of all the nation of Israel. And did God bless him? He sure did. He went from a little shepherd boy that was feeding the people in the army to the king of the nation of Israel. I wonder if he wouldn't have done that. I wonder what he would have missed out on. What adventure from God. Daniel, who was in the lion's den. The king says, everybody will bow down to us. Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody will bow. Daniel, you need to bow. I like you, but you need to bow. I will not bow down. He said, I will not. I will put my God first. He said, well, you're going in the lion's den then. You're going in the fiery pit. Get the deal? You're going to go in a place where it's going to be bad. They trusted God, and God did amazing things to them. Peter, he was at least the first to step out of the boat. Now think about that faith that that took. Stepping out onto water, you've never seen that. What did God do with him? Because of maybe that statement right there. He brought the word of God to his entire people, the Israelite people. How about Paul? He was the first to actually take the word of God to the entire world. God did amazing things with his life. No wasted. How about Stephen? He was the first martyr. He died for Christ. He stood up and said, no. He said, it is Jesus I love. And they stoned him to death. He said, he is the Lord and Savior. Now, here's what I've read in the Bible. Some of the rewards, some of the blessings for God will not come this side of heaven. It said some they only saw when they stepped into glory. Moses. But they had to take that step of faith first, and God says, I promise you. So some of these that have gone before us have got some amazing rewards when they stood before God. But others, many of us others, the blessings are currently right now for you. And for you, if you're my age, look at me. If you're my age, look at me. The blessings are not only for you, but if you're you're strong with your faith, it's for you and your children's children. It goes down to generations. That's what hangs in the balance. We'll never know. I'll never know if I would have pleased my coach what he might have done. I didn't even give him that opportunity. I didn't trust him. Do you trust God? You trust him? This is not going to be easy. Some of you, I'm going to encourage, just do it. Start off with your time. Be here. Make a statement. Start off with your talent. Say, I want to serve. Start off with your treasure. Write that check. If you make X amount, take the first 10. Give it to God and say, I'm trusting you now. Challenge him on it. See what he does. Tell me your story. See if it works. Church, I recommend they do a 90-day tithe challenge. If after 90 days you're not happy with what God's done with that money, they'll give it back to you. If I can figure out a way I'll speak to our treasures, then I'll put that in for you. Because I'm that faithful that God will do it. If you come back and say, no, it didn't work, fine. We'll keep track of that money for 90 days. Give it back to you. Some of you maybe can't go all in. 
but you're just going to have to take little steps with the goal of giving that first to God. And I think God honors that. I think he blesses that. John 3, 16. The principle of the first that God took to, to the degree that only God can. For God so loved the world that he gave his first and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God didn't give 10% of anything. God gave 100% of everything. He loves us. He's trustworthy. The principle of the first is true as it was when God started this whole deal. And it's still true now. Father, we come to you. And we thank you. We thank you that we can celebrate that there's a group of people that you're faithful to as we're faithful to you. Father, help this be an adventure for us. We want more of you in our life. We want more of these quote-unquote holy coincidences. We want more of knowing that this is the divine favor of you in our life, that what we're doing is right. And dear God, even if it brings some heavy burdens with it, we thank you for that, dear God. We know you can lift us through those. But that's the adventure. We don't want our life to just be some mundane life that at the end of our days didn't really have any risk involved, didn't really have any faith involved. Father, we thank you for your son, and we thank you for that our grace in him. It's not, it's not conditional. We know that if we believe in him and we trust in him, that his righteousness is brought upon us. He takes away our sin. We trust that. But dear God, help us to live this life, this life right now, with an abandon towards your son. Help us to not be fearful and to trust you, God. God, we thank you for this time period. We thank you that to be rich in you requires faith in you. Father, we thank you that you're true and you're real, and we want to please you. Hear our words as we sing this song. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with me. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. From my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no
child of God. I'm encouraging everybody to come back next week. But before I do, I want to just share something with you. It can be overwhelming at times <clears throat> to think about giving X percentage to God, money-wise. Giving your time to God regularly every single week. Giving your talent to God because we're tired and it's been spent all week. It can be overwhelming. But there's one story in the Bible that tells me about a principle that we're going to learn next week that is just an amazing story. This guy named Abraham. And God told him, He says, I'm gonna have you have a kid. So that ain't gonna happen. You don't know what's going on with my my family, my wife. No, it's gonna happen. He has this kid. Then he tells him, I tell you what I want you to do now. I want you to take your kid and I want you to sacrifice him. Bring him to the altar. Now can you imagine this? I mean, if, if God asked me to sacrifice one of my children. And I compare that to giving a little time, talent, and money. Not even close. Here's my checkbook. Here's my giftedness. Here's my time. Unbelievably, Abraham was faithful. He brought his son. I'm thinking, this is whack. This is crazy. Now, right when he got to the point where Abraham was by faith, God said, no, I'll never ask any of you to sacrifice your son. And instead, he said, but when you offer faith to me, and this is what we're going to learn next week, I'm the God of multiplication. And I will fill your quiver so full. I will, I will make it where your cup runneth over that you'll look back and you'll say, I was faithful to the end. And then God said, I'm not going to make you sacrifice your children, but I'm going to sacrifice mine because I love you. This faith walk is a journey of love, not sacrifice. But it is, we're missing it. I hope you come back next week. You learned today the principle of the first. Next week, we'll learn the principle of multiplication. You'll love that one. Part three next week. Hope to see you then. Thanks for coming. Kingdom for